Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I just want to say how grateful I am to have the opportunity to speak at this conference. Dr. Moore described it earlier on as a celebration of early Irish law, and I commend Katrina for, for taking the initiative and in organising this. It's a pleasure to share the stage with such esteemed speakers as well. I'm going to share some research that I've done last year. I'm a graduate of, of law in DCU, and um, for our dissertation, I decided to focus on the Brehan Law. And I wanted to, well, in the context of past and present, I wanted to consider whether there were any features of the Brehan Law that could be used to reform something important in society today, with the understanding that if we could show something in an extreme example, then it should be able to apply to more and um, less extreme examples for reform. So I'd ask you just to try and imagine for a second if we could have a society without prison. Do you think that, that would be possible tomorrow? Do you think that it's, it's, a, it's attainable? Well, under the Breton laws, we had no system of prison. So I want to look at the system of imprisonment, our penal policy, from a couple of general broad areas, which is going to be morals. Is it a moral thing to do? Is it utilitarian? Or what's the social benefit that we derive from imprisonment? And uh, is it economically viable? And if I can show that on these three broad areas that it doesn't, doesn't meet the mark, and then I'll what I'll do then, I'll, I'll look at some features from Breton Law and see if we can meet the shortcomings of our current penal policy with the uh, principles of the Breton Law. Before I go on, I just want to say I, I am not naive to the uh, practical difficulties that there would be to abolish prisons outright across society and I'm not asking that we should do that but I do think that trying to have a society where prisons are not necessary where the social needs and are, are met is definitely something that we should aspire to it could even be the next milestone of the civilized world and we had it here as I said in Ireland ourselves a professor of philosophy in Princeton University Kwame Anthony Appiah was asked to consider what will future generations condemn us for and he listed the system of imprisonment as one of the most morally reprehensible features of modern life. In addressing this, he, he said, well, when, when these sort of issues come up, society has these norms ingrained in us, and we sort of like, we, we can't imagine a society without prison. And he likened this to the motion of abolishing slavery in America, which would have led people to ask, not see the, the, the benefit that could be derived from, from abolishing slavery, but they would ask, well, who is going to pick the cotton? You know, there's these sort of unethical things ingrained in us, and sometimes we need to look at them, just take a step back, and I'm asking you to do that today with regards to, uh, to prison. So if I can show that our penal reform, our penal policy doesn't meet the, meet the standard um, morally, or if we take Jeremy Bentham's utilitarian philosophy, we should only make decisions that produce the greatest good for the greatest number of people. If we can see an alternative to prisons that create a greater good, then that's the, one, that's the choice that we should take. And from an economic point of view, we should take the, the course of action that provides the most uh, financial benefit, the least input for the most productivity. So I'm going to just focus a little bit on the prison issue first of all, to highlight just how serious it is, and then I'm going to go to some features of the Breton Law and hopefully get some sort of synthesis from that. So, we have these rationales for why we imprison, the reasons why we have imprison, uh, imprisonment as a form of punishment. And uh, I'd like you to just keep these in mind as we move forward. One of the rationales is retribution, which is the punishment that the offender gets what they deserve. It's they, um, they should be punished because they've caused a the harm. We should ask ourselves, what is punishment though? It has been described as a, um, a painful or unpleasant circumstance. That can take many forms. Shame is an unpleasant circumstance. Um, another one of the rationales is incapacitation, where we, we remove the offender from society to prevent them from committing more criminal acts. But what we do when we put them into prison, petty criminals with you know, violent criminals, we are allowing a situation to, um, to breed where petty criminals can be educated into more serious criminal activities. We also put people in prison so that they be rehabilitated and come back out and be fully functional members of society. And another reason we do it is to, to, to signify our denunciation, society's denunciation against those activities. We say it's, it, it's repugnant. But when we look at the fact that recidivism rates in Ireland do not diminish, they, they always stay high, repeat offending rates, we can say rehabilitation isn't working, social denunciation doesn't seem to uh, put people off deterrence, it's not working as a deterrent. Also, when we imprison people for non-violent offences, which we do in this state, we imprison people for traffic offences, we imprison people for not paying their TV licence, 
what we've done is we've just diminished the stigma of what prison was supposed to have in the first place. It's now no longer a place for the most violent criminals. We had a, a woman in, in, in prison there for protesting at Shannon, an elderly woman, Margaret Darcy. We have a society where we, we permit this to happen. We're okay with this. It costs 65,000 euro a year to keep a prisoner uh, incarcerated. 60% of these prisoners come from poor, disadvantaged areas. And in 2009, 90% of all people incarcerated were for non-violent offences. Um, there's 4, 000, about 4,000 people in prison at the moment. So if 90% of people are in there for non-violent offences, then we can say there's about 10% 10 of people who are in there for violent offences. That's 400. So if we had the money that we're spending on these 4,000 and we're only focusing on 400 people instead, surely we're going to be able to get them the resources, the rehabilitation, the proper uh, facilities that they need so that they will become functional members of society once again. I'm not going to dwell too much on the human rights aspects, but Ireland, the Irish government has been attacked by the uh, international standards of human rights for our prisons. We really need to, it's, a, it's an issue that the government really needs to address, but it's not on the agenda because the recession, there's, there's other things that, that are more important. And no politician wants to, seem, to be seen to be lenient on a criminal because it's going to lose them votes. So the prison system and the rationales that we use, they are not moral, they are not utilitarian, and they're not cost effective. So using a prison as a way of addressing criminal behavior is just irrational. There is, there is no rationale to it. The burdens that we have from imprisonment greatly outweigh the possible benefits. So we need to ask ourselves as a society, can we afford not to consider a radical reform? I'd like to share a quote with you from R.W. Bentham, who was a barrister, and he wrote this in the 1950s when he was um, it's in a paper, The History of the Bench and Bar in Ireland. And he said, Irish irreverence for law does not stem from a sympathy with crime or wrongdoing in general, but rather from the fact that the Irish, who have a long memory, are aware even now that the law in Ireland is not Irish law. However just it may be, and it was once most unjust, it does not command reverence as a native institution, but simply respect nowadays as an essential part of the machinery of government. And um, also speaking in the Dáil, Eamon O'Creeve mentioned, uh, he brought up the Breton Laws and he said that the interesting feature of the Breton Laws is that they had the inherent loyalty of the people and any laws that we introduce must have the loyalty of the people. We have a foreign law system in this country the Irish people can never really feel a, a synthesis or a connection to that law, a loyalty to that law, a reason to uphold it as a part of our culture, part of our identity. And Dr. Heron mentioned about the uh, the vault guys, the, the, the spirit of the people has been lost, and, and it's lost from the law. And I think it was probably deemed impractical to, to reintroduce it after independence. There was a lot of other things going on, and it seemed a shame that they spent so much time concerned about the clothes that they were going to wear rather than how to actually introduce these policies into our new system. So to take a look at how they dealt with crime under the Breton law now, it was a completely different distinction to what we have now. First of all, there was no idea of a state being an injured party. There had to be a victim, there had to be an actual human being who had been wronged, who could hold their hand up and say, this man has caused an offence against me. They were treated as civil in nature, and the only criminal behaviour was when there was a willful civil wrong, when you had done something intentionally, the fine that you would be charged would be, would be higher to represent the fact that there was a criminal element to it or a willful wrong, and that was where we get the deterrence from. We can give a higher fine, for, so we're saying we, we, don't, we don't agree with that behaviour, it also shows social denunciation. There was a huge focus on restitution, obviously, in the Breton law. The aim was to restore the victim to the position that they were in before the wrong had taken place. And this included murder. That was the, the, uh, the punishment for committing a murder, or the, the consequence of committing a murder was that you would be fined. And when I was doing this research, uh, you know, it raises an interesting point. Is it appropriate to put price tags on crime, as the Brehens did? Is it appropriate to say, well, somebody's been assaulted, we're going to value this at 10,000 euro or whatever it is. And I would say to that, well, is it any real difference than saying, um, well, 1,000 euro or three, five years of that man's life in prison? 
we're both we're saying to the victim in each case that your suffering is equal to this much time or money. It's, it's pretty much the same thing. And I think if you were to ask yourself which is the more moral of the two, and um, if if there's a victim family, say a member of their family has been murdered, is it more moral to take the offender in and incarcerate them indefinitely and leave the family to it with no compensation? Or is it more moral to try and compensate the family? Uh, the, the principle that the Bretons used was that we should try to alleviate the suffering of the victim by sharing in it. And that's the best that they, that, 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 that they could do. There's also in, in uh, tort law, I'll just mention this quickly, the, the uh, neighbour principle which was uh, coined by, by Lord Atkins, which was um, in negligence we should be cautious not to cause injury to our neighbours. And I don't see why that cannot extend to acts of a criminal nature as well. I, I think we should, we should be able to redefine what criminal activity is in accordance with the Brehan law. And if we did that, overnight our crime levels are going to diminish because we're no longer calling a traffic offence a crime. We're no longer calling litter offences a crime. So the only, our crime rates are going to be violent criminals and we're going to have prisons and we're going to have space for them and we're going to have money to deal with them. The family unit was also a hugely important part of, of ensuring this sort of justice under the Breton laws. Uh, they acted as a surety group, as we heard earlier on. And the, the family unit itself was the legal person, it wasn't the individual. So if you were wronged, your whole family was, was the claimant and they were also the victim. So what this does, if you look at it the other way, if you're going out into the world and you're going to be interacting with people, you're not going to be reckless because if you cause harm to somebody indirectly or willfully, you are actually causing harm to your family. And that could be seen, you could actually see the effects of that. So you're going to be a lot more conscious of what you do if it's your, all your uncles and aunties are the ones who's going to be bending your ear if you get into trouble. We also heard that the, uh, the system wasn't egalitarian. I remember when I first started learning about the Breton Law, I had the utopian view that it was this egalitarian perfect system, but it wasn't. It was actually quite the opposite. It was a very hierarchical system. All ranks and status was defined down to a fine detail. And I actually don't think that's such a bad thing. I think we have hierarchy in, system, in our system today at the moment. We don't necessarily recognise it, and that's probably worse than not having a higher, or not acknowledging the hierarchy. They said, we do have this. People, some people have more wealth, some people have more merit, some people have bigger families, and that defines the status. Now, the, this is where we get the honour price, the idea of an honour price. And what that allows the judges to do, it gives us a variable factor. It gives us an extra variable in, cal in calculating damages. We say, we say today justice is blind and that man and that man should be both fined the exact same amount of money. But if that man is much better educated and he's coming from a higher status and a, a place of privilege, should he really be fined the same amount? Is that fair? Are we taking account of the differences? And the Brehans, the Brehans did do this. This is something that we could possibly introduce over, it's probably take many years of, of research and defining our society, but it could be introduced. And I think what this would do as well, especially in the political context, it, it, it sets the bar much higher. A politician who lies or, or anything like that has a lot more to lose if their honour price is on the line. Uh, I believe one of the punishments under the Breton law was exile. Um, I wouldn't be against seeing a few of the politicians today being exiled. But, um, they were also very economically motivated. This is one thing we can't ignore when it comes to the Breton laws. They were like, I've heard it being described as anarcho-capitalistic. They, they're really willing to do the difficult calculations to come up with the most just uh, remedy. And I liken this to um, Posner, who was a legal jurist in the 70s, who came up with the economic analysis of law in America. And he was hailed that this was like, you know, groundbreaking stuff at the time, looking at the law as being a, about commercial agreements. So when a judge is deciding what fine to give out, he's taking into account the cost effect across society. This is exactly the way the Brehans used to do it as well, except it's a little bit different. There's a lot of Brehan law principles echoed in Posner, but he lacked, in my opinion, he lacked the moral basis that the, that the, Brehan, the Brehans had. He believed, like what I'm arguing here as well, that we shouldn't use prisons for people who are productive members of society. He believed that wealth creators should not be imprisoned. Poor people, that's okay, because they're not producing, they're not creating, ec uh, you know, ec they're not economically uh, producing. But those who are, are wealth creators, they shouldn't go to prison. 
Whereas I think in the Brehm law, they would extend the principle across the board. Everybody has a role to play in society. Everybody has a contribution. So taking any member out of society away and incapacitating them is actually a detriment to all. And just on that note as well, um, I meant to mention this before, we're talking about the amount of, the amount of uh, money it costs for, to, to keep prisoners uh, in jail. Not only, if we, if we imprison somebody for a non-payment of fine, and there was 8,000 people in prison for non-payment of fine last year, not only do we not collect the money from the fine, that's gone, we're now paying to keep them in prison, and we lose 8,000 people productivity, we lose that productivity hours for society, they could be working, they could be bringing stuff into the community, but we take them out and we, we sort of, we're, we're robbing ourselves three times. So, when I think about the Britain law, I, I, I imagine what it would have been like if, when the Anglo-Norman invasion started, that instead of this huge conflict of not just cultures, but it was a clash of legal systems, what if they had developed in a much more complementary way? What if they'd been friendly? And what if we had developed a, a hybrid system where we could take the best elements of the common law and the best elements of the Breton law and remove the ones that are contradictory and have uh, fused these principles together? For example, they didn't have police back under the Breton law, but we kind of need them today. So, you know, we can, we can, we can homogenize these concepts. And what I'm arguing for here is an adaption of our policy, not a regression to some primitive or old way of being. It's, it's about having the benefit of hindsight now to look back at what they had back then and say, well, what elements can we use in today's society? With Dr. Moore, you were talking about you know, the utopian side of the Breton law, but, uh, and that's true, I do see that, but we can probably take the best bits of, these, of both societies, acknowledge that there was problems in the Breton law, and look for the answers in the common law, and, and vice versa. Um, I'd also like to mention that if you look at the Breton law comparatively with other systems, similar systems of law, like the Hindu law, which was described as primitive Sharia law, Native American law, um, African tribal law, they're remarkably similar. What this suggests to me is that what we observe in these systems is human organization, a natural human organization in the absence of colonialism, in the absence of you know, controlled uh, centralization. This is how we organize ourselves when we're left to our own devices. And uh, I think that, that makes a re very strong case for for, for looking at these in a new context. And when I hear people describe these systems as primitive, the word primitive means primary, first, foremost. I agree with that. They are. They are the primary systems. This is the, the form, these are the root systems of human organization. I believe that with the common law, we've sort of taken a wrong turn in the last 700 years of, of, um, of law and development. I believe we've taken a wrong turn. And we're trying to address these problems instead of going back to where we were our first, our first starting point, our first principles. I, for part of my research, I, I interviewed uh, Dr. Colman Etting, who's actually a lecturer in, in Minuto. He's a lecturer of early Irish law. And I asked him, well, where can we go with this? Where, should we, where can the people go with this breath of law? How do we get it to come back? And he put forward the idea of, well, there's a lot of academics who write about it, fair enough, but... A, 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 a sort of a think tank or an association of people that is made up cross discipline law, history, but also of non academics as well. I think that the people, there's a hunger for this out there. There's people out there who, who know a little bit about the Breton law and are really intrigued in it. There's some people who've never even heard of it. And they're Irish people. They're being, you know, take, that's a part of their culture that's being taken away from them. They're being deprived of, the part, of a part of their identity and they're very strong part of their identity as well. And given the context of what's going on in the country these last number of years, it's probably more important now than ever to look at this again and to go, uh, to, to try and get that sense of not, not nationalism, not national pride, but, you know, a belief in Ireland as a great country. Well, that's me, guys. Thanks for your time.